from the same group as the first speaker, I believe. Uh, and he is going to talk about twins and uh, twins are false friends. And you also have 15 minutes, including discussion time. Go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, my name is Max Weber. I'm uh, from the same group as Stefan. It's also a joint work with the uh, Saarland University. And uh, now I'm talking, I'm going to talking about um, the relation of energy consumption and performance of configurable software systems. Um, Yes, and uh, let's start. Um, what is the thing we um, we want to we want to achieve or we want to do with this study? Um, yeah, ultimately we want to uh, reduce energy consumption of uh, software systems, and we want to do this to yeah, of course, uh, yeah, um, reduce um, money or uh, to uh, increase the battery lifetime of uh, mobile phones and uh, yeah, mobile devices and yeah also help to reduce the impact of the um, of the IT industry of software systems on the uh, climate change and how we want to do this um, I think you already know this uh, we want to use uh, software configurations um, we want to do this because um, if you imagine uh, software today almost all software systems out there are configurable and um, there is so and and the point is that there is already a configuration out there in the system that is better that, than the configuration you want to use so we can use this to reduce for example performance and and also energy consumption um let's let's um yeah wrap up some things about configurable systems so you can imagine configuration options for example are um yeah the number of cpu um uh, the number of threads in the CPU or the number of um, RAM that you, you want to use, or you can enable options like cleaning or compression and do some database options. And all those uh, configuration decisions have an impact on properties of your software system like performance and energy consumption. They might increase them, they might decrease uh, the values, and they um, yeah, might not, not affect um, the properties. And there is already work on... Um, on like modeling and tuning um, those uh, those configuration influences in uh, for configurable software systems on the performance side and there's also um, already work on the energy side but what's the problem now here um, the problem is that for tuning and for, for learning model and for tuning the um, properties we need uh, measurement data and especially on the energy side it's it's hard to get if you imagine um you you want to do energy measurements and you want to improve the um, energy consumption of your uh, software system then uh, you are on some pc and you have like a pdu and you um, need to yeah measure the uh, uh, the uh, why are you executing the software system? You measure the need to measure the energy consumption, <clears throat> so you need extra devices. You um, introduce um, compared to performance, you introduce more measurement noise because those devices usually measure at at uh, lower clock speeds than the internal clock of your um, PC, and yeah, it's you need extra knowledge to uh, yeah to use them. Um, in the end, uh, in each PC that we have, there is an internal clock that that runs on like nanoseconds accuracy, and uh, energy measurement devices either introduce um, yeah noise or <coughs> yeah uh, you need extra devices. <coughs> um, okay, and what's the idea now? We thought that we can use the performance that is already available, all performance values, as a proxy for energy consumption to yeah to reduce the number of measurements that we need to do on the energy side or to like um, improve the accuracy of energy measurements. Um, we do this by uh, on, on three three kind. Uh, we do this. We investigate this uh, relation on the uh, system level. So we see the software system as a black box. We do it on like option level. So we introduce configuration options to the to the system level and see if, if it helps. And then uh, we do this also on, on white box or on function level and uh, see if we can like give the developer um, more hints on how to look for uh, hotspots and bugs. Okay. Um, we are also not the first ones that uh, thought of uh, yeah comparing energy consumption and performance. Therefore, we did the literature study uh, investigating um, yeah how what what's the knowledge out there, and it turns out that there is um, 
work on, on different directions there. There is, for example, um, there is, for example, work that uh, that found positive correlation between energy consumption and runtime or performance. And that means that um, the longer a program runs, the more energy it consumes. This is the, the obvious thing. Um, and it's, it's yeah, it's um, really often out there. There's, but there's also the uh, the opposite thing, the negative correlation. This happens when we have to decide uh, between optimizing runtime or energy consumption. So you need to optimize either one or the other. There's also work on this. And we also found in a literature, um, no, no, absent correlation, when we can say, okay, um, we can optimize energy consumption. There is, there is improvement possible. And performance don't get exact, uh, um, affected at, at all. So, and this is also an interesting case because, yeah, we, we can optimize in one direction and don't need to care about the other. Okay, and we, and what, what we found out is that there is no work um, that um, incorporates the um, um, configuration options of software systems to it. And there is uh, also no work to, that uh, like founds um, sufficient reasons for why is it that uh, we have different kinds of correlation, maybe also in the same software system. Okay, and therefore we did also an um, empirical study measuring many different software systems, including uh, video encoders, uh, databases, and so on. Um, we, we measured different configurations and we measured performance and energy consumption of them. And we provided all the data in, in a public available data set. So you don't need to do the uh, measurement work again. Um, so what what comes out? So in in the first thing was that we uh, watch the software system as a black box, and we see okay in general. Uh, you you see here um, on on one axis the energy consumption, and on the other axis the uh, performance or the, the runtime in seconds. And each dot is a measured configuration. So we have here measure many measured configurations in this in this example, and we see that uh, we have in general a positive correlation. So the longer the program runs, the more energy it consumes. Um, what we also see is that it's it's it shows us some kind of Simpsons paradox that we have inside our data in subspace of the configuration space, um, also negative correlation. So for these configurations, if we make small configuration changes, then it might be that we um, yeah improve performance but uh, reduce the energy consumption or vice versa. And we also have in this example kind of um, non-correlating configuration groups. Um, where we say, okay, for these uh, cases, we can optimize energy consumption without affecting performance. Okay, um, but if we model this in a simple linear model, then um, we might encounter a relatively high error in, in percentage error. Um, the second case, then we see, okay, um, if we introduce configuration knowledge, for example, a configuration option calls, and we have four different values, and we can identify subspaces of these configurations, then we see that the um, yeah the, the um, correlation greatly improves. And if we if we then um, see okay, we we learn a model for each subgroup, then uh, also the the percentage error in decreases. Okay, but we have also an opposite example. <clears throat> At the start, we have a great uh, correlation um, for the whole system, and if we see then, uh, if we then um, um, activate the encryption blowfish, then we see okay, performance and energy consumption decreases both, also relatively linear. But um, if we then um, look at interactions of configuration options, like if we also um, enable memory tables instead of cache tables, then we see that we are in a group where we can optimize energy consumption without without touching performance. Um, the, conf the correlation uh, of the subgroup is really, really bad. And also the mean absolute percentage error is bad. So we can't use a model. This means we, for this subgroup, inside the subgroup, if we want to optimize there, then we need to uh, do measurements um, to do this. Um, yes, and now on the, on the white box side, we we try to um, yeah we try to learn simple single factors that um, translates the performance to the energy consumption. And in this example here, we see like the black line is the distribution of all factors of all configurations of the method find best match of LSIP. And we see okay, we can like identify one one value maybe uh, with, with a relatively 
certainty. And we see, okay, if we also introduce uh, configuration options, this um, this supports this claim that all of three all three values of this option. Um, yeah, shows the same value, um, but we have also like uh, something like this in the block com in the compress block uh, method. Um, we have here multiple factors, and if we turn on then the um, the configuration options, then then we see that there's a difference for these factors if we use single single cores or single threading and multi threading for this method. And we have also um, like more. Um, more difficult examples where we have such complicated distribution. And if we um, divide them into in these options, then the picture gets clearer. But we have also like um, values for this configuration option level that are not that certain. So we um, yeah, decided to um, define those methods that as that they cannot um, model as easily as they are as the, as the other. Okay. Um, in the end, we can say. Um, um, performance and energy consumption are sometimes twins and sometimes false friends. Um, we have seen this on on, on the three levels uh, on the black box side. We see okay in general we can uh, use performance as a, as a good starting point to select uh, energy efficient configuration. But if we introduce configuration options to this whole topic, then we get much more information about it on the black box side and also on the white box side. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. We have a few minutes for questions left. So any questions for Max? There's a question at the front. Uh, thank you, uh, Misha, JetBrains Research. So question might be a bit naive, but still. So you said it is hard to measure energy consumption and we need to install a particular device to measure it. But my naive approach would be to run a program on a laptop which usually reports the energy consumption, and we also kind of use energy consumption over time as some kind of proxy. Uh, what would be wrong with this approach? Probably, uh, if people don't use it, there is something wrong with it. Yeah, um, so you, I don't know how you measure energy consumption on a laptop, maybe on, on uh, investigating the battery or so. Um, I can imagine that there, um, the um, measurement error may might be somehow um, large, but I think the uh, greatest weakness of this approach is the scalability. Uh, we measured in this study thousands of configurations um, with repetitions and so on of the software systems. And if you imagine a cluster of multiple machines, then you can measure easily performance, but maybe not that easily the energy consumption. Thank you so much. Uh, there is another question in the back. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Just a uh, question about whether your method approach is applicable for data-driven software like, you know, there is a trend of green AI within that community. I was wondering if my voice is problematic. Okay. Uh, yes, I think so. Um, I think you, we can uh, use this approach like for all software systems that have configuration options and for yeah where we can measure performance and then we can see, okay, um, do we have a positive correlation or negative? This would be the first step. And is it, is it yeah relatively clear? And then can we like tune energy with performance or not? And if not, then yeah, we need to do extra work. Okay, sounds good. So in case of even st stochastic software, this can work basically with some tuning. Oh, I, I don't get your question. But can you repeat, please? Oh. Uh, the, oh, okay. Uh, in the case of stochastic software, when there is uncertainty in, inherent in the, the software, it can work, right, potentially? Yes, if you uh, like model performance and energy consumption with an uncertainty approach, then yeah, you have uh, like distributions instead of uh, point estimates. So uh, in this study, we, we use the simplest or one one really simple way to like um, do the transfer. Like we have only linear models with, with a single linear factor and we are able to model uh, almost everything with there. And yes, maybe it depends on the case studies that we selected. Um, they are 
case studies of the performance community that are of, that is often used and not so often from the uh, stochastic uh, community but yes of course there, there are tools like also from our group called p4 p4 and you can use them like for modeling uh, performance and also other non-functional properties um, as, a, as a distribution thank you so much uh, is the question long or short short if it's short, then it's, we have time for one more. It's short. Um, so sometimes you're not uh, completely aware of the hardware that you have because you um, are working with data centers um, or you have external cloud uh, functionality that you use. Is your approach also applicable in such kind of systems? So we know that the hardware has, has, has a really large effect on yeah, performance and energy consumption and so on especially if you um, reach certain hardware limits like RAM and CPU and so on. Um, this approach yet is not aware of, of this problem, but it's uh, yeah, one of the next steps that we want to go. Thank you so much. Let's thank the speaker again. And then we are moving on to the third presentation. The third pre presenter is uh, Adalberto from Huawei, and this is a software engineering in practice talk, and it's about auto-tuning elastic applications in production. Roberto, you have 15 minutes. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Yep, uh, so this project started my postdoc at the University of British Columbia, and in partnership with the IBM, today is an ongoing project at Huawei. And what it's about. So imagine that we have a popular online service that receives millions of requests. But the traffic varies over time, as you can see, it's seasonal. And also the traffic varies according to the endpoints available uh, in the application, in the services. And what you want as a product owner is to have the maximum performance of our service while we also saving costs. What, how can we do that? Today, we just apply uh, auto-scaling, but it's far from ideal. So we need to balance uh, those conflicting goals, performance and costs, and you need to do that uh, according to these variations of the workload. So that we're trying to do. But there are some problems here. Uh, so as I said, the workload changes, and we need to scale to match to this workload. And we have several problems that I will go in depth next. The application is dynamic because the workload changes over time. The application changes over time, especially with microservices that has several rollouts over the week, or even in a single day have many rollouts. And when we try to improve the performance of a single service, we have to tune, fine tune countless knobs because the application runs on top of a, a different layers, many different layers. So going to the first problem, about the outscaling problem is that ideally we should uh, apply horizontal and vertical scaling. But if we do that, the application is spinning in a feedback loop because if we scale horizontally, we need to reduce the size of our replicas. But if we reduce the size of our replicas, maybe it can trigger the horizontal scaling again. So it keeps this ping pong uh, relationship and we can diverge for an optimal uh, state. Uh, also, uh, when the application is deployed in a cloud, for example, it's not only suffers with the, those dynamics like workload and its own uh, configuration, but also to the neighbors in this cloud. For example, it may suffer with con resource contentions uh, because other services are consuming the same resource in the same node. Uh, and also, uh, because that, uh, this is quite difficult, uh, engineers, operation teams only stick with the horizontal scaling and apply these with large over provision uh, replicas. And these, during that scaling, will eventually waste resource because it's coarse granularly, uh, the, the size of those uh, replicas. About the dynamic environment, uh, we have this is a typical application running on many different layers. So we have the framework, the JVM, Docker, Kubernetes, 
uh, Linux, uh, different cloud providers. So there is a lot uh, of parameters that we may tune to improve, uh, for example, the performance of the application. But most of those uh, parameters has interdependence. So we cannot tune the size of the connection pool without concern about the heap size of the JVM. And the heap size is in strictly uh, correlated with this uh, memory allocated to the container and so on. So it's not just that simple to just adjust one single configuration. As I said before, the workload varies uh, regarding multiple aspects, volume, target, frequency, and for each workload, the application has its own requirements. There is a specific requirement for each workload uh, observed. So it may require a specific configuration for a specific type of workload. As we can imagine, uh, operations teams has no enough time to master the best configuration for each workload observed. So it just stick, as I said, with an over-provision uh, replica to tackle with these many different workloads that may happen. But it, as you can imagine, is a lot of waste of resource. And finally, as the application uh, runs on top of many, many layers, each layer is with hundreds uh, of knobs to tune. It's quite complicated. It's a multi-dimensional tuning that we have to handle. And if for our objective is not a simple objective like just improve the performance, but also you may want to reduce the latency. You may want to res reduce the resource utilization. So it's also a, a multi-objective uh, optimization that we want to do. Uh, in our systems. So it's quite complex to reduce the cost, reduce the resource, and improve the performance in such complex space. As you can see, this graph is something that happens under the hood during the automatic tuning of a complex systems like a cloud, applica cloud native application. So our solution is proposed this uh, smart tuning. Uh, what it does, it tune applications running in production on the fly. So we don't need to do any tuning offline, it runs online, keep tuning the application according to the different workloads that may happen during the execution application. And this tuning, basically, it does a safely uh, vertical scaling in response to the horizontal, horizontal scaling to balance those multiple objectives that may be set by the uh, operation owner. Uh, yeah, so this is a brief overview about the solution. So we have the smart tuning, uh, and smart tuning employs Bayesian optimization to do this tuning. And what we want to tune is modeled by this uh, objective function. So as you can see here, it's a math formula that we can put any metric that can be observed in our system. So if you want to minimize something, we put in the denominator, but if you want to maximize something, we put in the upside of this fraction. And we can model anything that can be observed. For the search space, we define the search space based on the parameters that we can tune. In our project, we limited these parameters in environment variables. So anything that can be changed by environment variables can be adjusted by smart tuning. And the, the dependencies between the, these parameters in this stage is set manually because it's quite hard to identify the causality and the dependence between uh, those uh, parameters. So with the search space uh, and the objective function, the smart tuning can, uh, over time, try different configurations in a training replica, and when it finds a good configuration for observed workload, it applies this configuration in production. So it separated the training phase uh, in a specific replica, and then it moved to an entire production system to avoid any disruption uh, of the system. So here is an overview of the algorithm, how it works. It's a quite simple state machine with three states, training, reinforcement, and probation. During the training phase, uh, the smart tuning will explore the search space, try to find uh, a good configuration, a configuration candidate to improve the current configuration applied in the application for this workload being observed. So it tries for, for example, for at least 10 iterations, and when it finds a good candidate, it will promote this for the reinforcement. 
In the reinforcement phase, it ruins this, in, this uh, configuration for a longer interval, so we can guarantee that uh, this configuration is good enough for the application, even if the it's running for a long time and suffering with some contention problems that may happen in the cloud. And then when it figure out that configuration still holds as the best, it will promote it to a probation phase when it will be applied in production and then it will guarantee that it's good enough even under a shared environment. For example, many replicas sharing a same database. So if it holds even in this phase, it will be kept in production, otherwise the system will revert to the previous version of the configuration production. Yeah, so these are some results. Overall, uh, it can have a good improvement in performance, efficiency, and cost of the application. Due to the time, I cannot go through those, all those uh, data. And here you can see that uh, the improvement in cost, cost reduction when applying the tuning and without app by apply the tuning. So the green line is a simulation with the application no tuned with the original configuration deployed. And the blue line is what could, could be saved applying our tuning find by the smart tuning for this specific application and workload. So we move forward because of the time. And yeah, it has one important limitation. That is, it cannot handle multiple services at once because uh, based on optimization is great for optimizations in general, but it cannot handle a large number of parameters, so at most 20. So this is a limitation in our work. So we are working on that to reduce the search space to better address this uh, limitation in large systems like microservices applications. And the main contribution of this work is that apply tuning on the fly in dynamic applications and dynamic scenarios uh, in the cloud. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have time for one or two questions. Hi, thank you very much for the great presentation. One quick question, if I understand cor correctly, this is using re reinforcement learning, right? Yeah. Um, so usually in this space, linear programming, LP solver is also very popular. Have you compared with the other results between this reinforcement learning and LP solver? Yeah, the problem of the LP solvers and this kind of solutions is that it takes a long time to get a solution to be applied in production. And using Bayesian optimization as a reinforcement learning, we can, at each iteration, apply a partial result in production quite quickly. So this improve, uh, we have a good solution faster than if, if you need to wait until the end of the linear programming. So this is our decision about this uh, approach. Thank you so much. Uh, we have time for one more question. So one question that I have, and I understand that you work in industry and this is a, this is a software engineering practice talk. So usually from my, you know, I'm an academic, so I have somewhat limited industry experience, but mm -hmm. usually the problem with autoscaling isn't so much that people really want to squeeze out the li last little bit of performance, but that people really, really never want to be under, uh, uh, under provision. So effectively, you know, the, the way how most of my industry contacts think about the autoscaler is not how can we configure it so that we get the last 10% of, of performance, but it's how, how conservatively do we need to configure our autoscaler so that we always have enough uh, uh, performance. So I wonder a little bit from your practical experience, have you seen this as well, that people are willing to overpay just to be sure that they're, that they're, that they're, that they're, that they're not... Uh, yeah. Under provisioning? Yeah, the problem of that is uh, when we have uh, infinite out scaling, we will pay a lot. And cloud resource is quite expensive. I mean, people say, oh, it's not that expensive, but when we have a large system with hundreds of services running, this out scaling of over provisioned uh, replicas, it's a big deal. Because for a short time period, it will consume let's say, thousands of dollars. 
So even we, if we can reduce a little the, for example, the amount of memory used without compromise the performance is a big achievement because if we reduce a little in one replica, when we have 100 replicas running, it is a lot saved. So this is the main idea behind this. Okay, thank you so much. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. And we are moving on to the next talk in this session. And the next speaker is Joel Cooper. He is a PhD student at the University of uh, Adelaide, I believe, right? Yeah. Uh, and so Joel asked me to announce that he will be finishing his PhD in, uh, in September. So if you like what you're hearing and you need a new faculty member, come and talk to Joel after this talk. Yeah. You have so. Yeah, thank you very much, Philip, for that kind introduction. So I would like to talk about CryptoOpt. Um, which is my PhD project where we try to automatically optimize code for cryptography. And I would like to motivate this with uh, an example that we use our compiler, for example, Klang LLVM, and we try to compile our favorite uh, SSL suit for my newest uh, framework laptop. And we observe that the performance is not optimal. And that makes sense if we consider that um, compilers are usually uh, general purpose compilers and they're not dedicated and not designed to compile cryptographic code. So we have the two main observations that compilers are general purpose and cryptographic code is a little bit of a special snowflake. And with special, I mean that it's actually much simpler than the general purpose code, heavy on arithmetic rather than control flow whereas compilers are designed to optimize control flow, loop unrolling, things like that. So our idea is instead of compiling to fast code, we want to search for a fast implementation. And then in the full paper, you can read how we prove that actually correct. So I would like to now explain how we do that search. Um, we start off with writing some code with that, which does the job and is correct, and then we start modifying that code. For example, we change the order of two operations which are independent. We then have two mutations and we run them on the actual hardware and see which one's faster. So if that modification was a good one and we end up with a faster code, we keep doing that. We maybe use a different instruction at some point. And if it is not faster, then we undo that last modification and try again with a different mutation. This is like a first year student approach, but in professional terms, we call that random local search. We start in the configuration space randomly and then explore the local neighborhood for a local optima. If we do that many, many times, the performance can be gradually improved, as we see here. So on the x-axis, we see the modifications and mutations that we evaluate, and on the y-axis, we see the relative speed up compared to a Klang baseline. So we see that we start a little bit um, worse than what Klang would produce, and we end up with um, a speed up of 1.5, 1.6 for one particular primitive. So now that we have our optimizer, we need to feed it with um, implementations. And for that, I would like to introduce fiat cryptography. Fiat cryptography is a framework which is able to synthesize, so that means uh, generate proven correct implementations for for cryptography. And it does so by having a functional program which, which, is, then that, which is then specialized um, into for a given prime, for example, for a specific um, architecture, 64-bit, for example. So we have fiat cryptography on the left side and our optimizer on the right side. We then feed, we then glue them together with that, um, yeah, in that fiat IR and out comes fast assembly because we gradually improve the performance. And then just a little um, hint, we then have a checker which actually checks that that assembly that we generate is actually implementing the fiat IR. So we got fiat cryptography and fiat cryptography can generate uh, field arithmetic for these primes, uh, for these uh, cryptographic schemes that we see there. And we generated code for the multiply and square operations on, on 10 different machines. What we see in the table is uh, relative speed ups. So a higher number is better, 
And the higher the number, the, the more fast we are. And we see that for most of these uh, functions, we actually improve the performance, um, or at least match, for, for, for example, uh, we at least match the performance of the, of the shelf compiler. Well, and uh, yeah, let's quickly summarize. We turned the problem of compilation of straight line code into a uh, search. We use a random local search heuristic and the actual runtime to find a local optima. And then, this is sort of the full summary, we can now have a proven correct assembly for the field arithmetic that we get from fiat cryptography, now with on-par performance um, to hand-optimized assembly, which we can read up in the full paper. So if that sparked your interest, or if you want to work with that, or if you want to um, use that for your own favorite crypto system, or for your own special hardware thing, um, you can run it on your uh, own machine. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm done, and I would like to hear some questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have time for one or two quick questions. <clears throat> there is the, um, the modification loop. Is that operating on the intermediate representation or on assembly? Like, uh, what level is that modify check sort of loop that you're mm -hmm. looking at happening? So we pass that fiat IR into a crypt opt IR and we change on that operation level. So, yeah, like an add or an uh, like an add or multiply, which are independent, we swap them around. And then we can read off the assembly top to bottom, and then we glue them together with like move instruction and spilling and stuff like that. So it's like a little bit before the assembly where we do the mutation. Thank you so much. If there are no more questions, then let's thank the speaker again. <clears throat> We are moving on to the next presentation. So the next speaker is Nori Kuderk. Kuderk? Kuderk. Close. Uh, so Norik is a PhD student at, the, at Lund University in Sweden, very close to where I'm from. And he's going to talk about performance analysis with Bayesian interference. Uh, inference. Inference. Yeah, version inference. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, hi. Um, so, yeah, my name is Norik, and I work in. Yes, there's a work. Yeah. The context of like Java performance. So, I run stuff on my on my machine, and then I, I apply some optimizations to the program, and then I check if it runs faster. So, usually we get tables like this that you've probably seen before where we have basically like an optimization with maybe like a base level and then other optimizations we have, but we also have some kind of contextual information, which is like, was the JVM hot or cold or what kind of hardware I'm using? And then you get the execution time. And the questions you have are like, what effect does the optimization have on execution time? Or is this effect influenced by just in time compilation or machine architecture? So you can do it, try to like sort it out visually, where you do like lots of box plots, and if you have lots of features, it, the box plots get increasingly scary, so it's kind of hard to sort it out. Uh, so then you can turn to the like statistical literature. So this is like a fairly famous paper that suggests to use a technique called ANOVA. So I can take my data and I plug it into ANOVA, and I get what's called an ANOVA table that looks like this. And the problem that I have with this table is that I don't understand any of it. So there's lots of like different concepts and like the questions that I have is what, what does it measure and also what kind of assumptions is it making about the data that I have. Uh, and this seems to be like a fairly widespread problem. This is from a medical paper where you have like a decision tree to choose your statistical test. So you don't really know what it's doing but you treat it as a black box. So in our paper, we take a different approach where we do uh, Bayesian inference. So this is a paper that suggested it for software engineering. And the reason we do it is because, well, it's more explicit, so we know what the model assumes. Uh, it's more flexible, so we can extend the model if we have more questions. And it's also more intuitive, like we have fewer concepts to learn. Uh, so to show that it's more explicit, I will show like a linear regression, which is basically the linear regression that you know, but in the Bayesian context, we use two distributions, normal and exponential. 
and rewrite them as a bunch of equations. So at the top, you would have what you would write in R. So it's like the log of the execution time is modeled by like the mean plus the effect of machine, the effect of warm up, and the effect of optimization. And then at the bottom, this is the Bayesian equivalent of that, if you will. Um, you don't have to understand all the equations, but the point that you have to understand is that it, did, it does tell you that it assumes normal residuals, like normal noise, and also it assumes like common variance between those, like between the noise. So it doesn't assume that like some machine have different like noise level, like or, or that there's more noise for some machines. Uh, we can take that model and we can extend it. So what we do is that we implement uh, ANOVA based on that model. So the way we do it is that basically li linear regression, it, it, we have several coefficients which are grouped in like by which factor they consider. So they're in groups. So what we do is that we basically take those things and measure the standard deviation of those groups and that measures the importance of each of the factors, which is what ANOVA does. Uh, so the way we do it is that we take this model and we just uh, rewrite some of the equations to add more parameters. And because we add more parameters, we have to add more like uh, lines to the equations. You don't need to understand everything. What you need to understand is that it was pretty easy to do. And also, this is the entire statistical model. It's completely open and you see all the assumptions that the model is making. Okay, what can you do with this model? You can get these kinds of plots. So at the top, you have just comparing between two optimizations. And at the bottom, you have something which, uh, like intervals that explain basically the same thing as ANOVA. So it shows you like what features uh, were most important because the coefficients for those features are like further apart from each other. Uh, so here, for instance, it says that basically uh, which machine you use and the warm up are more important than uh, the optimization that you're making. Um, in the paper, we also show uh, another extension, which I don't have to talk, time to talk about now, but uh, it's basically interactions. So interactions are a way to be able to say uh, if an optimization works only in certain contexts. So you can say like it works but only on one machine or it works but only when the JVM is hot. And this, this is what this plot is saying, that one of the optimizations is like it only works when the JVM is hot. So in summary, Bayesian data analysis is wonderful. We should all be doing, doing it. Uh, and it's because it's more explicit. We know what the model assumes. It's more flexible, that we can extend the model and not break things. And it's also more intuitive. Uh, this was known before. And in our paper, we just show how to apply that for your performance-like measurements, where you, we use linear regression and add interactions and ANOVA to the model. With that, I will take your questions. Thank you much. Questions. There is a very excited person at the front. Yes. Thank you so much for the great talk. Uh, just wondering, uh, maybe I missed something. How did we choose the different features in the linear regression? Does that re rely on domain knowledge? Or yes, ab learn? absolutely. So uh, here, this is just um, this is just an example. Like in the paper, we saw basically a case study. Uh, and in the case study, we rely on like domain knowledge uh, to like choose, for example, like choosing that the machine, the JVM is hot or not. This is like something that you read about in like performance papers about Java. So the selection of the features is just, uh, I picked them up. Yeah. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh -huh. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on the tooling that you provide? Uh, for yes, uh, so one question that you might have is like, I showed a bunch of equations, and is that the actual model, or like, would you need to write the solver yourself? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, so we use, uh, the library we use is a Julia library called um, Turing, and uh, this is what you, you can use. So you write a function that looks very much like the set of equations that I've shown. Uh, and that, that's your model. And then you can use like uh, what's called a sampler uh, to run the inference. And uh, basically like for every parameter, you get a list of values that are like the likely values for that parameter. And then you can do whatever you want. Thank you so much. Let's thank the speaker again. And we are moving on. So the next presentation is on <laughs> runtime performance prediction for deep learning models with graph neural networks. And the speaker is Hong Yul Sang from uh, Chongqing University. Chongqing University. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you, everyone. My name is Hong Yu Zhang. Yeah, so basically this work is done at Microsoft Research Asia. Yeah, so we are here from today's talk. So basically many people are working on configurations, right? So for deep learning models, we also have many configurations. Sometimes we call it hyperparameters or different architectures. Yeah, so we have different, uh, for example, uh, architectural stars, different number of hidden units, different number of layers, right? Different uh, batch sizes, different uh, number of input channels, and so on. So basically, uh, for a deep neural network, we also have many possible configurations. Then, different configurations may lead to different runtime performance. Yeah, some configurations could lead to the model that is very slow, some configurations may lead to the model that uh, uh, is very uh, memory consuming. So, uh, so basically, there are a lot of benefits for predicting the runtime perf performance of a deep neural network. So, for example, if a neural network may take a lot of GPU memory, then it may uh, crash the the job may crash during the training process, then it may, I mean, waste a lot of time and effort, right? So it's possible, it's beneficial that we could predict the runtime performance before the model uh, was executed. In this way, we could reduce the number of failures, we could also improve uh, the productivity of deep learning uh, programming. So uh, for this work, basically we try to predict the runtime performance of uh, the uh, model, uh, especially the GPU memory consumption and the training time prediction, yeah. So yeah, this is uh, our work, we call it the DNPerf. So basically it's kind of runtime performance prediction uh, model. Okay, so I will briefly introduce this uh, architecture of the DNPerf. So uh, basically it uh, consists of several parts. Uh, this model will accept a computation graph, a model specification, and a runtime specification. Uh, and then uh, the model, we have a GN model, yeah, GN model, which will travels the computation graph to automatically yeah, generate the performance related node and edge features. Then we encode this uh, node and edge features, and then uh, we use uh, this uh, MLP, this uh, neural network, to predict the results, the final results, for example, the trading time or the GPU memory consumption. Yes, sir. so that's the overall workflow. And then I'm going to uh, introduce each major steps. Yeah, so the first step is about the computation graph, so we have a uh, concrete uh, Python program, DR program, and uh, we could uh, convert it into a computation graph. So behind the, behind the program is actually the computation graph. Yeah, so we actually uh, encode this graph, yeah, encode this graph. Uh, we identify the node features of this graph, we identify the edge features of this graph, uh, then we uh, encode these features, and then we use our GN model to do the prediction. So that's the overall picture. So for this graph, we have many nodes, right? So each node basically is an operator, is an operator like a count 2D, and average put 2D, dance layer, and so on, software max, and so on. So there are many operators. And also there are data and the control flow between the operators. Uh, then, uh, as I said, we identify node features and edge features. Yeah, for node features, there are many types, for example, operator type, hyperparameter, uh, input, output, tensor size, and so on. So these are the features of the nodes. And we also identify the features of edges. Yeah, for example, edge type, tensor size, bandwidth, and so on, right? And then, so we use GNN to encode these node and edge features. Uh, for traditional GN models such as GCN, the convolutional uh, model, and the GAT, they are basically uh, 
not uh, uh, flexible to handle the edge features. So they can handle the node features, but uh, they are uh, difficult to handle the edge features. So we uh, develop a novel uh, G G model, so-called ANEE, attention-based node edge encoder, yeah, to encode this computation graph. So for our model, we encode both node features and edge features. Yeah. Yeah, so basically we perform multi rounds of computation to encode the node and the edges. And then the, agree, uh, the final results are fed to the predictor, uh, basically a MLP layer yeah, to generate the final runtime results. So for the details about our uh, GGN model, this ANEG model, you can refer to our paper. Yeah. So basically we have many steps of doing this uh, uh, graph weights update. So we use this uh, mean squared error to design the loss function. So the output, the final output of this NEE is the result, is the result. Yeah, basically, for example, the memory consumption or the training time. Yeah. Okay, so we also did a lot of evaluations. So uh, we have two data sets. We generate two data sets. One is so-called HPO, hyperparameter op optimization data set. So we collect a lot of uh, models. They are all very famous models in CV and in NLP areas, like uh, there's a ResNet uh, and so on. Mm -hmm. And we also collect some unseen models, so basically yeah, some uh, the models, their configurations do not uh, appear in the training set. Mm -hmm. uh, so we change the hyperparameters of these models. Yeah, for example, change the batch size, change the input channel, and so on, the input uh, width, and so on. Then in this way, we generate in total about uh, 10,200 uh, configurations. So basically, each configuration corresponds to one model. So we have uh, more than 10,000 new models with, with different uh, hyperparameter values. Mm. So this is one data set, data set we call it HPO, and then we have another data set called uh, NAS, yeah, Neural Architecture Search data set. So we change uh, different uh, structures, ch change the structures of the neural network. We add a drop out to some models. We remove drop out from some uh, models. Uh, in this way, we generate about uh, 8,400 different uh, uh, models. Yeah, so basically for this data set, we have 8,400 configurations. And then uh, we use this uh, MRE, mean relative error, to uh, measure the accuracy of our model. Yeah, so basically our model will predict numerical results for example, training time or memory consumption. So there are numerical results. To measure the accuracy of our model, we use MRE. We also use this RMSE, uh, root mean squared error, yeah, to measure the accuracy. We also compare our model with some baselines, so basically different uh, neural network-based prediction models, like those based on RN, those based on uh, MLP, yeah. Okay, so overall results yeah, for predicting the training time, the training time, yeah, so we can see that uh, our diff perf model can actually achieve quite accurate uh, prediction results. The MRE, the mean relative error is only about uh, 7.4, yeah, so which is quite good, and uh, outperform all the other baselines. Yeah. And uh, for predicting the memory consumptions, uh, our MRE is slightly higher, 13.7, uh, but it's still uh, reasonable, uh, below 15%, and also higher than that of baselines. Okay, as I mentioned, we have some unseen models. Basically, we use unseen models to test the generability of our uh, tool. Uh, so we have some unseen models whose configuration did not appear in the training set. Uh, so we found that uh, uh, when we apply our tool to these unseen models, we can still achieve quite good uh, prediction accuracy. Uh, for example, for predicting the training time, our MRE is only about 7.7, .7, uh, 
uh, percent, which is uh, yeah, quite good. And for predicting the memory consumption, yeah, our, our model can achieve 13.3% uh, MRE, which is also good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, in summary, so basically in this work we have uh, described the DNN Prof, a noble runtime performance prediction tool yeah, for deep learning models. Deep learning models have many hyperparameters, many configurations, but uh, we are able to predict the final performance uh, based uh, on the initial configurations and uh, the computation graph, yeah. And our method is quite uh, uh, accurate and uh, outperformed the baselines. Okay, so that's all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> we have time for one or two questions. Okay, as long as there are no questions, I have one question. So this is a, this is a paper in the industry uh, track. Uh, yes, yes. So one fairly obvious question, I believe, is since you have very good numerical results, uh, mm -hmm. does Microsoft uh, intend to put this now into practice, or what, what, what will your industry partners do with the, the model that you have developed? Uh, they are still working on that. Yeah, working on that, try to apply it in practice. Yeah. So can you, can you say a little bit more about what this what's kind of stopping them? Because the numerical results are very good, so right. obviously there are still some right. challenges that you have not talked about. Can, can you talk about them or are they secret? Uh, for example, if the models are very large, very huge, then the efficiency could be a problem, yeah. So we still need to work on that, yeah. For large, for example, language model. Yeah, mm. that, that, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Uh, are there more questions? does not look to be the case, then let's thank the speaker again. Yeah, thank you. And we are moving on to the next presentation. So the next speaker is Misha. Misha Eftikiev. Uh, I am probably pronouncing that very poorly, but uh, Misha is from JetBrains Research and he is going to talk about uh, Adam and you will tell us what Adam is. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for the introduction. So today I'll talk about studying the performance of optimization methods on ML for SE deep learning tasks. And well, Adam is an optimizer. Yeah, so uh, when we train a machine learning deep learning model, uh, we need to choose an optimization method. And Walpert and McCready show that there is no preferred optimization method that would outperform all others across all kinds of problems. However, it is possible that for a particular kind of problem, uh, some method would be better than the other. For example, for NLP domain, Schmidt et al. shows that RMS probe optimizer is better than the others. Well, thing is, there were no studies for machine learning for software engineering domain and you wanted to check if there is uh, some optimizers are better than the others and whether different uh, aspects uh, affect the optimizer performance. So let me describe our setup in a little bit more detail. So as I said, and as I mentioned on the previous slide, we would like to evaluate the optimizer performance and whether it depends on different type of models. So we have four models here, two of them are uh, recurrent neural networks, one is graph neural network, one, one is a transformer. And these models have relatively small number of parameters in order of tens of millions. It would be nice to study bigger models, but that would be computationally prohibitive in our for our stuff. And we also considered two different problems. Uh, one is method name prediction, which is basically predicting the method name from the body of the method. And another is code summarization. We considered code summarization into doc string. And I would like to comment on our choice of data set for the method name prediction. So you can see that we took a big data set and, 10 and smaller data set with basically 10% of the uh, train for, of the big data set, Java Met. And motivation for that is that this allows us to study whether the size of the 
uh, data set impacts the relative optimizer performance, and moreover, this allows us to escape the problems uh, that are inherent to another popular Java small data set for which test part is different from uh, train and the validation part is especially uh, uns uh, not similar to the train part. Okay, so there are lots of optimizers available. When we started our studies, there were more than 100 available and it's impossible to study all of them. So we focused on 12 most popular that are available in the PyTorch optimizers package. And these are most probably most likely to be used by the practitioners. And for each optimizer, we also use for its look-ahead modification. And look-ahead is basically first uh, looking at several consecutive steps generated by a particular optimizer, such as Atom or Momentum or SGD, and then making a real step in this uh, uh, aggregated direction. And to further manage the computational costs, we use this two-step testing method. So basically, we first test all optimizers on the smallest data set available, and then we test uh, the top performing optimizers on the rest of the data sets. So we find that for the all factors we consider, the only factor uh, which really affects the relative optimizer performance is the choice of model. For example, code GNN versus code to sec. And uh, the rest of, of the factors don't, and we also find that optimizer performance can have a significant impact on the model quality. Uh, this is a near track, and this means there is future work to be done, and there are plenty of uh, options we didn't check due to lack of time and computational resources. Uh, Hyperparameter tuning is very, a uh, reasonable uh, thing to check, and it was done in other works which consider relative optimizer performance. And it would be also interesting to check dependence on the model size, because if, as I assume, there is no dependence on the, mo on the model size, in this case we would uh, be able to check optimizer performance on a smaller model and then generalize it to a bigger model, for the saving time in choosing the best optimizer. And well, as usual, there are more ML4C problems to consider and more optimizers to try. Following the popular informal grievance that this paper could have been a tweet, I summarize the main message of our paper in, in the tweet form. So thank you very much for your attention. Questions? I don't know, we are Twitter, I guess. There's a question here. Uh, first, thanks for you for your research, and I would like to know that the the model size. So in your paper, you use uh, Colbert code GN because nowadays Colbert, if I remember correctly, that is one hundred uh, million parameter. So so which one you use? And uh, we know that uh, recently we have the big lab, large language models uh, for code, for example, Palm Secure uh, by uh -huh. Google or other kinds. Uh, do you have the plan to test uh, this on those models? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I guess uh, the proper plan would be to, I mean, thing is, there is this combinatorial explosion, like uh, we have four models and then we have different optimizers and so on and so forth. So I guess the proper plan would be probably to tr test on like s very small models, like one million parameters, compare whether there, there is a difference to like 10 million parameters, and then make just very few tests on bigger models. Because I mean, training Palm or like Llama from scratch takes a very significant amount of time. And uh, if I am right and there is no dependence on model, model size and uh, it, it would uh, be right both in like 1 million to 10 million and like one, uh, 10 million to 1 million uh, range and this, uh, this several experiments would suffice. I think we have time for one quick additional question if there is one. Does not seem to be the case so let's thank the speaker again. And we move on to the final presentation by Gunnar Kudrajavets, uh, 
Gunnar has spent most of his career in industry and is currently finishing up his PhD. As I understand, then he is going to let us know who ate his memory. Well, um, it's my third talk this week, and I somehow end up being always the last person during the session. So I have this feeling of guilt that I stand between the audience, food, and alcohol. So my apologies. So this is an industry challenge talk. So I don't have overwhelming results or some sort of Turing Award worth kind of contribution to science. All I have is problems, and my entire talk is pretty much cry for help. We have a problem, there's a bunch of plenty of smart people in this room. Okay, can you help us? <clears throat> so for some context. So between all of us, we worked on the same problem at Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, and probably we can go on like do the same thing for the next 10, 15 years. I literally have friends at Google and Snapchat now working on memory attribution problem. But to understand the context better, let's look what this memory thing all about. So generally, when you look at memory management, there are two types of issues. There's correctness, like do we allocate and free correctly, do we corrupt heap, and that's kind of pretty good. We have tool sets, we have papers written, and second part is performance. And performance is where things are not so sexy, and everything gets very messy, and not much research is done, at least from my point of view, when it comes to memory manager performance and operating systems performance and so on. So what's this all about? If you look at performance engineering, then contrary to what textbooks tell you or you've seen in the talks, first question is always, whose fault it is? I mean, you may know this as fault localization or <coughs> root cause analysis, but what I really want to ask is, when things go wrong, where do we point our finger? Because we need to figure out who's going to investigate, what tools do we use, what priority to give, and we need to understand where do we point our flashlight to. Let's start also with the status quo. So when I asked my colleagues for quotes about the current status of memory attribution in various operating systems, all the quotes I got back were not compliant to IEEE policy, ACM policy, and some of them probably break federal law as well. So I borrowed a quote from Linux, uh, Kernel Developers Summit. So here we have an operating system. It's 22 years old, and here is the status of memory management and memory management attribution. We have no clue where the memory is going, and we have no clue how to find out who owns what, who is responsible for what. So welcome. This is 2022. Maybe things have gotten better since I wrote this paper. Maybe not. Well. So attribution. <clears throat> Most modern operating systems can tell you how some subset of metrics work at process level. However, in real life, that's not sufficient. We need to know maybe per trailer level, per dynamic library level, per component level, and component can mean tons of different things. It can scope user mode, kernel mode. We may have to talk about different user scenarios. We may have to talk about different times. We may have to talk about mix of everything. And what we tend to do is every company, every product, Every operating system, every programming language, everybody writes a different custom solution. Mozilla has one, maybe FreeBSD has one. I've written at least two. Some of my colleagues have written three or four. So every time we go, we reinvent the wheel, how it looks in real life. So this is very kind of primitive. This is probably like code, code which like, has been like this for maybe 30 years. We write some code, we tag it, then we somehow use a stack to figure out where the memory is going. And you can see at this, how many problems it has. So first of all, to attribute any system, who's going to rewrite all the code? What happens when attribution changes? What happens to all the dependencies? How do you deal with cases when component A uses component B? How do you deal with all kinds of circular dependencies? How do you scope? How do you filter? Like, there's all kinds of things to be solved. So from engineering point of view, first of all, what is memory? Like, if you ask an engineer, an engineer will tell you, do you mean commit size, working set, page pool, non-page pool, compressed memory, virtual memory, and 15 other terms. Second thing, map is not a territory. So typical way to do performance engineering is you measure something in the lab, you have your benchmarks, then it goes to production, and everything is different. Uh, typical solutions, profilers, we used to call them kind of toys. It's like, it's fine for most of the applications, but try to make something work with Windows or WhatsApp or Instagram or whatnot. Lack of infrastructure and supporting tooling. So as you can see, there's tons of stuff to work from engineering point of view. Uh, 
research. So one of the critiques I received about my paper was that, listen, you're just a code mercenary, you're trying to solve a problem for whatever, Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, whatnot. There's some truth to it. Most of the applications don't care, and very few applications really, really care about memory. There are opportunities at operating systems at all, so if anybody wants to hack with a kernel, different libraries, there's tons of work to do. Programming language research also. Would it be cool if you can ask your programming language where did all the memory go to? Uh, memory allocator research, tooling, infrastructure, data structures, algorithms. So if somebody wants to work on this stuff, you can literally pick your poison and you can figure out where to focus some energy. And literally, to end up on a more positive note, if anybody wants a job in this area, come and talk to me. I'll put you in touch with the right people. Uh, you'll probably have like next 10 years of your life filled with all kinds of engineering problems if you want to talk about memory attribution or if you want to make any difference in that space. Uh, if anybody wants to collaborate on that topic, this topic is kind of dear to my heart, mainly because I've spent so many nights like sleeping at my desk and trying to figure out who allocated what. Uh, that's it pretty much for me. It was a short talk. Uh, we want to talk about it more. Find me somewhere in the hallway. I'll be more than happy to help you. Thank you so much. We have time for one or two questions. So, ah, there's a question here, Misha. Once again, maybe a naive question, but still. Um, so some operating systems like Windows or Linux are quite old, and other ecosystems like Android or iOS are arguably newer. But looks like memory management problem is persistent everywhere, and I would not say that Linux is worse off than, say, I don't know, iOS in that respect. Could you explain why is that? <clears throat> so Android is pretty much a version of Linux kernel. So Linux is pretty much coming from 60s and uh, coming from like 70s in Unix. iOS, which is a version of Mach kernel and Darwin, also comes from 70s. So all the code we're talking about is still written in the 70s using the same patterns. It's everywhere. So I literally like spend time working on Linux, iOS, and Windows. It's pretty much the same set of problems because of the same architecture and historical roots. Nobody has done any state-of-art work when it comes to like operating systems. I'll be more than happy to talk the details. It's uh, it's uh, later also as well. Are there more questions? Somebody wants to complain about the statement that nobody has done operating research in I don't know what you said. Twenty years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like if you look at uh, how things work, it all comes from like '72. Any more questions? On that depressing note, I think we're done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then let's thank the speaker again for ending on a very high note. And thank you to all the speakers. And with that, I think we are ready to close the session and go to the break.